Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. Hello chickpeas and gentlemen, welcome to another Clickhole quest for useless knowledge via the many roads of Wikipedia. I hope you've all survived election day, and I especially wish that to Tony, because it was his birthday and he gave us a gift of a starting point for this video. Please join me in wishing him a merry personal new year, and also recognising that he intentionally passed through rough and ready last weekend, on which I had made a previous video, and even brought me along for the ride to Helen Back Lane. Thank you Tony, your kindness and generosity do not go unappreciated. And now let's completely ignore the fact that I left this legend empty-handed on his own birthday, and open the birthday present he gave us instead. A creepy cheese called Kasu Matsu. Here we go, creepy cheese coming right up. Wow, it's automatically classified as rotten cheese. Kasu Matsu, literally rotten slash putrid cheese, is a traditional Sardinian sheep milk cheese that contains live insect larvae. It's literally got maggots in it. Can you see them? Hold on, we need to see if we can see the maggots. I can't really see individual maggots, but I believe they're in there. Derived from Pecorino, Kasu Matsu goes beyond typical fermentation to a stage of decomposition brought about by the digestive action of the larvae of the cheese fly. They are deliberately introduced to the cheese and they help break down the fats. It becomes very soft with some liquid seeping out. The larvae themselves appear as translucent white worms. That is that is revolting, Tony. So it's created by leaving whole cheeses outside with part of the rind removed to allow the eggs to be laid in the cheese. The eggs hatch and the larvae begin to eat through it, but and by the time it's ready for consumption, a typical katsu matsu will contain thousands of maggots. They eat the, they eat it with the maggots. Oh no, it's considered unsafe when the maggots are dead. <laughs> that is the marker of safety. Because of this, only cheese in which the maggots are still alive is usually eaten. Oh, how can you do that? How do you do it? Oh my god, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bold foodie, but not that bold. Allowances are made for cheese that has been refrigerated, which results in the maggots being killed. Oh, that, that's, that's good. Yep. Uh, it's often cut into thin strips and spread on moistened flatbread. Oh, what a nightmare. It's believed to be an aphrodisiac. Are you joking? Who the hell gets hot and horny on maggot-filled cheese? These Sardinians, man. I don't know. I didn't have questions about Sardinians before, but now I definitely have questions. Wait, hold on. The larvae in the cheese can launch themselves for distances up to 15 centimeters or six inches when disturbed. Diners hold their hand above the sandwich to prevent the maggots from leaping. Some who eat the cheese prefer not to ingest the maggots, so what do you do, pick them out? No, they put them in a sealed paper bag. The maggots starved for oxygen writhe and jump in the bag, creating a pitter-patter sound. When the sounds subside, the maggots are dead and the cheese can be eaten. Oh, I can't. Oh, oh no. Oh no, this is horrible. According to some food scientists, it is possible for the larvae to survive the stomach acid and remain in the intestine, leading to a condition called pseudomyosis. I have a feeling that's what we're clicking on next. Just gonna say that right now. The cheese has been outlawed in the EU. <laughs> You face a heavy fine if you have it. Yeah, that's fair. I'd say that's fair. It's available on the black market though. Oh my god, there are loads of regional variations of this as well. There's a goat milk version, aged in white wine with grapes and honey, that prevent the lava from emerging, giving the cheese a strong flavour. Oh god. Other regions in Europe have traditional cheeses that rely on live arthropods for ageing and flavouring. Which rely on cheese mites. I don't know, any, you know, I'm, the cheese mites even seem more palatable than the maggots. I'm sorry, we just associate maggots with dead bodies, so. Well, happy birthday, Tony. I'll be sure to get you a slice of this maggoty cheese someday. Oh, the picture for this pseudomyosis. Do we want to click on it? What else can we click on? Mm, you know, I thought we were gonna go to pseudomyosis, but that looks disgusting. Fuck it, let's do it. Myosis, parasitic 
infestation of the body of a live animal by maggots, which grow inside the host while feeding on its tissue. Although flies are more, most commonly attracted to open wounds and urine or feces soaked fur, some species can create an infestation on even unbroken skin and have been known to use moist soil and non-myatic flies as vector agents. Oh, what on earth is this? Oh, I regret this already. Larvae may invade unbroken skin or enter the body through the nose and ears. Ooh, and others may be swallowed if the eggs are deposited on the lips or on food. When I get nervous, I start to sing. Okay, if it's in the skin, you get painful, slow developing ulcers or boil like sores that can last for a prolonged period. If you get it in your nose, it obstructs your nasal passages with severe irritation. Death is not uncommon. That's that's lovely. You can even get facial edema or fever. Um, if it gets in your ears, you get crawling sensations and buzzing noises. Smelly discharge, no! located in the middle ear larvae may get to the brain. Yep, that's that's what we want. Yep, lovely. Ophthalmomyosis, as that in the eyes, causes severe irritation, edema and pain. There is apparently a type of these flies called the screw worm fly. These definitely screw you over, that's for sure. Congo floor maggot. How did it gain the term floor? Okay, here's the pseudomyosis that's um, caused by that cheese. Oh my god, do we want to see the ultrasound? Of course we want to see the ultrasound for maggots. Where are they? Is it this? I can't tell what's a maggot. Is it all these thingies maybe? Oh, that's horrible. Everybody's gonna sleep well tonight after this, I tell you that. Prevention. Don't eat rotten cheese, okay? Just don't eat them. Okay, treatment. Once an infestation is established, the first response to the cutaneous one, the one in the skin, is to cover the air hole thickly with petroleum jelly. Lack of oxygen then forces the lava to the surface. <gasps> oh my god, then you literally have them crawling out of you. No. The lava must be eliminated through pressure around the legion and the use of forceps. So basically what this says is we squeeze it like a zit with a metal tool until they pop out. That is charming. Maggot therapy? What? There's such thing? Throughout recorded history, maggots have been used therapeutically to clean out necrotic wounds. Maggot therapy it is. Okay, I may have to blur that picture. Ooh, type of biotherapy involving the introduction of live disinfected maggots into the non-healing skin. Oh, there are the maggots in medical packaging, lovely. Maggot therapy improves healing in chronic ulcers. Oh my god, they put it in people's feet. I don't know if I could handle that treatment, honestly. I'm somebody who's had insects for pets, by the way, and this is Ooh, next level. A moist, exudiating wound. Does it mean it's like oozing? Yes, it's oozing. Patients and doctors may find maggots distasteful. May? There's possibility for somebody to find them tasteful. That's, well, I suppose there is that cheese, my God. Although studies have shown that this does not cause patients to refuse the offer of maggot therapy. Well, I guess if you're really desperate, you'll try anything, won't you? Maggots can be enclosed in opaque polymer bags to hide them from sight. Dressings must be designed to prevent any maggots from escaping while allowing air to get to the maggots. Dressings are also designed to minimize the uncomfortable tickling sensation that the maggots often cause. History. They've been used since antiquity as a wound treatment. Reports of the use of maggots for wound healing by Maya Native Americans and Aboriginal tribes in Australia. There have also been reports of the use of maggot treatment in Renaissance times. Military physicians have observed that soldiers whose wounds had become colonized with maggots experienced significantly less morbidity and mortality than soldiers whose wounds had not become colonized. That's interesting, actually, that you did better if you got a maggot infestation. Physicians included Napoleon's general surgeon. Yeah, I'd like to see him try throwing some maggots into Napoleon's open wound. Interesting that the planet has developed a creature that takes only to dead tissue, but not living tissue. Confederate medical officer during the Civil War said, maggots in a single day would clean a wound much better than any agents we had at our command. Well, it clearly works. I mean, it makes sense if they're eating the rotting flesh, they're getting rid of all the problematic bits, but it is very nasty. Okay, well, I think we're done with the maggots. I think we've um, we've truly gotten uh, a much higher dosage of maggot activity than we could have ever asked for. Of course, now we're left with the only clickable links being ulcers and injuries. Let's check out out Napoleon's surgeon. Let's see what else he had up his sleeve. Okay, so his name was Baron Dominique 
Jean Larray. He was an important innovator in battlefield medicine and triage. He is often considered the first modern military surgeon. What is with these French doctors? That's what we had in the last click hole too. It was always the French guys. The son of a shoemaker, but was orphaned at the age of 13, and then raised by his uncle, who was a chief surgeon. He served a six year apprenticeship, and then went to study in Paris, but his studies were cut short by war. And his destiny was changed forever. He was appointed in the Navy and gave lectures. He did his thesis on Eskimos, interesting. And he initiated the modern method of army surgery, field hospitals, and the system of army ambulance corps. He established a rule for the triage of war casualties. Triage is um, when you decide whose priority or not, isn't it? Yeah, process of determining the priority of patients' treatments by the severity of their condition or likelihood of recovery with and without treatment. That is a very tough job on the soul, I think. Treating the wounders according to the seriousness of their injuries, regardless of rank or nationality. That must have been kind of radical. I wonder if this was an interesting turning point in warfare. He became a professor, but then was appointed as surgeon in chief of the Napoleonic armies and went to Egypt the year after. He amputated a leg in two minutes. That's pretty awful. At Waterloo in 1815, his courage under fire was noticed by the Duke of Wellington, who ordered his soldiers to not to fire in his direction so as to give the brave man time to gather up the wounded and saluted the courage and devotion of an age that is no longer ours. Then he tried to escape to the French border but was taken prisoner by the Prussians who wanted to execute him immediately, but he was recognized by one of the German surgeons who pleaded for his life. Damn, bros supporting bros. Perhaps partly because he had saved the life of, of Blücher's son when he was wounded near Dresden and taken prisoner by the French, he was pardoned and invited to his dinner table as a guest and sent back to France with money and proper clothes. That is, that is very honourable. He devoted the remainder of his life to writing, but after Napoleon died, he actually started a new medical career in the army as chief surgeon. His writings are still regarded as valuable sources of surgical and medical knowledge and have been translated into all modern languages. That's intense. Be read by everybody. Oh, the highest medical honour is named after him. Well, that was impressive. That lifted my spirits after the um, maggots. You know what? Let's do a let's do a big 180 and go to Eskimos. Two main peoples known as Eskimo, the Inuit and the Yupik of eastern Siberia and Alaska. A third northern group, the Aleut, is closely related to both. Pronunciation not my strong point. Please forgive me. There are more than 183,000 Eskimo people alive today. Oh, that's actually less than I would have thought. Of which 135,000 or more live near the traditional circumpolar regions. The governments in Canada and the United States have made moves to cease using the term Eskimo in official documents, but it has not been entirely eliminated and the word is in some places written into tribal and therefore national legal terminology. I don't really understand why they wanted to stop using it. Is it because it's sort of too general? So Canada officially uses the term Inuit. The US government government legally uses Alaska Native, but the designation applies to enrolled tribal members only. Interesting, that seems unnecessarily complicated, but I might be missing something. Etymology. Actually, I never knew where the word Eskimo came from. There exists a scholarly census that the word Eskimo etymologically derives from the, the Inuaimun word Eskimo. Eskimo. Yeah, that sounds like Eskimo. Meaning a person who laces a snowshoe. An origin, it's not pejorative. The word Asimu means she laces a snowshoe in Inu. Oh, some people consider Eskimo offensive because it is popularly perceived to mean eaters of raw meat. Interesting. An unnamed Cree speaker suggested the original word that became corrupted to Eskimo might have been Askamiku, which means he eats it raw. Is it a bad thing to eat raw meat? Say that to everybody who enjoys sushi. Or carpaccio. Or fucking rotten cheese, for that matter. I am impressed that people have managed to survive in this kind of region. It's kind of insane to me. God, a lot of different languages. Jeez, that's a cool hat. That's really pretty. That is a very cool hat. Let's check out the Greenlandic Inuit. God, Greenland is 88.9% Inuit, including multi-ethnic European Inuit, mainly Danish and other Nordic. Greenlanders are people identified with the country of Greenland or the indigenous people, the Greenlandic Inuit. The Inuit are descended from the Thule people. I have only ever seen this word here as those rooftop racks. You know what I mean. 
84% of Greenland's landmass is covered by the ice sheet. So Inuit people live in three regions, the polar, eastern, western. The eastern Inuit live in the mildest climate and they can hunt from kayaks year round. A majority of Inuit prefer customary local foods like whale skin and dried cod over imported foods like sausage or chicken. There's an article called Kayak Angst, that's where we're going, is a condition likened to a panic attack, which has historically been associated with the Inuit people of Greenland. It has specifically been described as an episode of intense anxiety among seal hunters fishing on one-man boats. It has additionally been associated with the Igluic Inuit of Northern Canada, who are said to suffer wild hallucinations of mythical spirits, including visions of a sea ermine. Isn't an ermine like a weasel? Yeah, it's a weasel. Kayak Angst has been described since the 1960s. I'm sorry, clearly this is a real problem I'm laughing at it, but I never thought angst would follow the word kayak in any circumstance and yet here we are. Happy 2020 everyone. It was initially noted as an issue faced by hunters out alone on a calm sea or lake, especially with the sun directly overhead or shining into their eyes. Episodes often occur in foggy or overcast conditions as the sky is reflected on the still, mirror-like water surface, making it difficult to distinguish the horizon and determine up from down. Oh, that does sound trippy. That would get you after a while, for sure. A loss of direction, helpless feelings, and psychophysiological responsivity are characteristic for kayak angst. A sensation of cold rising from below can make the kayaker feel as if the boat is filling with water. They may also feel overcome by an intense fear of drowning. The way to break the effects of kayak angst is reported to be vigorously and strenuously continuing to paddle. Those who have survived. Good lord, how many people don't survive? That's interesting. Agree that it is far more beneficial to move than remain stationary. Due to the specificity of its characterization, kayak angst can be considered to be an example of a culture-bound syndrome. That's where we're going. Culture-bound syndrome, or folk illness, is a combination of psychiatric and somatic symptoms that are considered to be a recognisable disease only within a specific society or culture. But is it only because those, for example, in the kayak angst, they tend to kayak a lot? But if, say, I kayaked a lot in areas where the water was really still, I would feel the same way, so isn't it sort of general? There are no objective biochemical or structural alterations of body organs or functions, and the disease is not recognized in other cultures. Because they're not kayaking like that, but probably the same thing would happen. Ooh, here's a whole list. Oh, this is exciting. Running amok. Brain fag syndrome? Is that politically correct? Ghost sickness. Oh my god, there are so many. Oh, there are so many things to click on here. Hua Biong is a mental illness which arises when people are unable to confront their anger as a result of conditions which they perceive to be unfair. It's kind of just sound like interesting psychological issues. In India, there is Dart Syndrome, a condition found in the cultures of South Asia in which male patients report that they suffer from premature ejaculation or impotence and believe they are passing semen in their urine. That is strangely specific. Fear of Windigo, a mythological creature or evil spirit from the folklore of the First Nations tribes. Morgellons is a rare self-diagnosed skin condition reported primarily in white populations in the United States. It has been described as a socially transmitted disease <laughs> over the internet. Yeah, all right, let's check it out. Morgellons is the informal name of a self-diagnosed, scientifically unsubstantiated skin condition in which individuals have sores that they believe contain fibrous material. That is also oddly specific. It is not well understood, but the general medical consensus is that it is a form of delusional parasitosis. The sores are typically the result of compulsive scratching and the fibers when analyzed are consistently found to have originated from clothing and other textiles. Where's the internet bit? People usually self-diagnose Morgellons based on information from the internet and find support and confirmation in online communities of people with similar illness beliefs. What if they're not crazy and everybody's just saying they are? No, they probably are crazy. <laughs> In 2008, the Washington Post reported that internet discussions about Morgellons include many conspiracy theories about the cause, including biological warfare, nanotechnology, chemtrails, and extraterrestrial life. Somebody found a cut with some fluff in it from their sleeve 
and went straight to aliens and nanotechnology. That escalated very quickly. Jay Traver, a University of Massachusetts entomologist, was known for one of the most remarkable mistakes ever published in a scientific entomological journal. The publishing in 1951 an account of what she called a mite infestation, which was later described by others as a classic case of delusional parasitosis as evidenced by her own detailed description. The paper has done permanent and lasting damage to people with delusional parasitosis. Oh my god, that sucks. That's, that's butterfly effect for you right there. Matchbox sign. Let's check out matchbox sign. Also referred to as the Ziploc bag sign or the specimen sign is a psychiatric finding. Oh, that's not what I expected. Patients with delusional parasitosis often arrive at the doctor's office with this medical sign. The individual typically collects items extracted from the skin and stores them in a matchbox or similar small container to present to the physician as proof of a parasitic infestation. Scabs and skin particles. Oh. The matchbox sign is present in five to eight out of every 10 people with DP. That's so funny. So doctors, when they get somebody come in with a matchbox or a Ziploc bag of something, they go, oh, it's one of those. Okay, here we go. Delusional parasitosis. Please, no pictures, thank you. Okay, DP is a mental disorder in which individuals have a persistent belief that they are infested with living or non-living pathogens, such as parasites, insects, or bugs, when no such infestation is present. They usually report tactile hallucinations known as formication, sensation resembling insects crawling on or under the skin. Well, they'll need to double check that they haven't eaten some of that cheese. I wonder if it's largely based out of fear. If they get a small preceding event and then they overthink it, literally anything can be interpreted to support that fear of it becoming something worse. Probably just treated with therapy. The only treatment that provides a cure and the most effective treatment is low doses of antipsychotic medication. Cognitive behavioral therapy can also be useful, so I was right. It's therapy, because it's in your head. Average duration is about three years. Oof, can you imagine going three years thinking there are creepy bugs in your skin. That's horrible. It was a Swedish neurologist who discovered it, or who first described it as a pre-senile <laughs> delusion of infestation. So some people call it Ekbom syndrome after him. The term fell out of favour because it also referred to restless leg syndrome. Oh, didn't know that. Well, I think that's probably a good note to end on. Considering we started this Tony's birthday edition of Clickhole Wednesday with his creepy cheese, Kasimatsu, which features apparently delicious maggots, depending on who you talk to. We then went on an adventure through using maggots in medicine, which led us to Napoleon's chief surgeon. From there, somehow we ended up taking a detour to Eskimos because we then went to kayak angst, which is one of the strangest things I've ever read. And then through culturally related psychoses and illnesses, all the way to uh, people who believe they have bugs in their skin. So we, we almost did a loop. Anyway, if you enjoyed this click hole and weren't too disgusted and would like to come back for more, uh, please subscribe, I would really appreciate it. Leave a like, drop a comment, do a share, and yeah, stay tuned for another video on Saturday. And until then, I will see you in the next one. Bye.